I want to give you an update on the Revive the Hive. That was the uh, meeting at the high school a few weeks ago. Uh, it's sponsored by the kids within the school. Two of our young people went forward and, and was baptized. we baptized them last Sunday. Uh, went to a meeting Thursday evening. Uh, they say that the high school kids are really excited about what went on. Uh, it's spreading, so we're planning a number of other things uh, over the next uh, year, uh, for every three to six months. So, uh, uh, in, involving with the high school and also with the community, there's uh, uh, a number of churches that are working with this together. So, I uh, just wanted to sort of give you an update on that. Uh, 366 for the end of the service. Would you please out take out your outlines? <clears throat> Last week, we looked at the first of the five callings that God has on your life. And that is God has called you to be loved. This week, we're going to look at the second calling of life and it is this you have been called to not just be loved but you have also been called to belong to belong to God's church which is going to last for eternity the Bible says in Hebrews 2 10 God is the one who made all things and all things are for his glory he wanted to have many children share in his glory. God created the entire universe because he wanted a family. And God does not want his children to be orphans or street ch children. He wants to put them in a family. And the family is called the church. I want you to write this down. The second purpose of my life is that God formed me for his family. Folks, if God didn't want a family, you wouldn't be here today. But God made you because he loves you and he wants you to love him back and he wants you to be a part of his family. This has always been his plan. Ephesians 1 says his unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. So God's first purpose of my life is that I am to be loved by him. But the second purpose of my life is that I belong to him. And that I belong to his family. God calls his family the church. His family is the church. The church of Christ. The church of God. 1 Timothy 3 says, I am writing to you. So you will know how to live in the family of God. That family is the church of the living God. The support and the foundation of the truth. So God formed me for his family. And his family is called the church. And the third thing that I want you to get is that I am called to belong to that family. The Bible says in Ephesians 2.19. So now we're no longer visitors or strangers. Now you are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. This is the second calling or purpose or reason or mission for your life. First, know God who loves you dearly. But second is to be a part of his family. And that family is called the church. Romans 1 6 says, You are among those who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. Called to belong. 
That's what we're looking at this week. In fact, the word church in the original New Testament Greek means called out. It is talking about the group of people who God has called out. Christianity is based on God's word. And God's word says the church is the call out. In other words, folks, church is not an event. Church is not a program. It is not a building. If I ask most people, what do you think the church is? <coughs> most people think of a building or they think it's somewhere I go. I am going to go to church. Folks, church is not something you go to. Church is something you belong to. It is not an event. It is not a location. Church is a relationship. Now we worship here. We have a place here. But the church is the people of God. It's our relationship. What I want to do today is share with you five benefits of belonging. Because God designed his family, the church, to meet your five deepest needs. In fact, the church is the only thing that can meet those needs. The Bible calls the church by different metaphors. The church is called a family, a temple, a body, a flock, and a garden. Each of these have a profound implications for your life. If you understand the five meanings of these five metaphors, you will understand how the church was designed. God's family was designed to meet your deepest needs in life. The first metaphor that the Bible describes the church is a family. It is a family. And in a healthy family, one of the benefits of a healthy family is that you're taught who you are. You learn your identity. So the first thing I want you to write down, the first benefit is that in God's family, I learn my true identity. Folks, you're not going to learn it in the world. You're not going to learn it from your parents. You're not going to learn it from anybody else. Your true identity is found in a relationship to God's family. Now, most everybody is concerned about identity. So often we try to find our identity in the clothes that we wear, the brands we use, and the kind of logos that we attach to ourselves. But the truth is, most of your identity comes from your relationships, for good or bad. If you have good relationships, you have a good identity. If you have a bad relationship, your identity is much more difficult. I, in the past, I have been a grandson. I have been a son. I am a father. I am a husband. I am a grandfather. I am a team member. I'm a small group member. I am a pastor. All of these are relationships that define who I am. You know who you are in relationship to other people. What this means if your connections or your relationships get broken or if they're poor, you have a hard time knowing who you really are. Anybody who's gone through a divorce knows that the divorce after it is the question, who am I? Because your relationship was tied to that person. When someone has been married for a long time and that spouse dies, it's normal to think, who am I? What is my place? 
What is my role? Or you get laid off from your job and your identity has been tied to your work. You're going, who am I? What is my identity? So our identity is actually tied to our relationships. Yeah. Folks, the problem was with this is that a lot of us did not have very good relationships growing up. Some of you could probably say my family was dysfunctional or my family was broken or my family was really non-existent. So how do I know who I really am? Folks, here's the good news. Ephesians 2.19 says you are members of God's very own family. And you belong in God's household with every other Christian. It doesn't matter whatever, what other families you had. Your most important family is God's family. Why? Folks, it's permanent. It's going to last forever. Actually, your physical family was a channel to get you into God's family. God used your parents, whether they were good or bad or indifferent, or you never knew them. God used them to bring you into this world. But his real goal was not to keep you in that family, but to put you in his family. Folks, your spiritual family is actually more important than your physical family. As great as our physical families are, folks, no physical family lasts. People grow up. They move away. People get divorced. People die. No physical family lasts. We know that. But our spiritual family is going to go on forever and ever. In fact, the Bible says that God created this entire universe for his spiritual family, the church. When you get your identity from that, then you get a long-term identity. The problem is we go out trying to look for identity in things that are going to last. The world judges your identity on all the external stuff. The world says you're short or you're tall or you black hair or red hair or you're Asian or you're Latin American or this is your job or you're an American. These are all interesting identities, but folks, none of them are going to last. Yes, I'm an American. I love America. But there's something more important than that. I am a member of the family of God. Folks, America is not going to last. No kingdom lasts a thousand years or two thousand or ten thousand years. Where's the Hittite, Hittite Empire? Where's the Assyrian Empire? Folks, they don't last. So if you want your identity to last, you put it in something that is never going to change. And the Bible says that God's family, the church, is going to go on for all eternity. Hebrews 2.11 says, Jesus and the people he makes holy all belong to the same family. This is why he, talking about Jesus, isn't ashamed to call you his brother and sisters. Did you realize that Jesus calls you his sister? Do you realize that Jesus calls you his brother? And he says he isn't ashamed to call you his brother or his sister. Have you ever had a brother or sister when you were ashamed of? Now, don't answer that. <laughs> but folks, Jesus is not ashamed to call you his brother or his sister <coughs> because you're in the family. I mean, you may be a little weird, 
but you're in the family. You may have sin in your life, but you're in the family. And brothers stick up for brothers and sisters. And the Bible says that Jesus is not ashamed of you. By belonging to God's family, you learn your true identity. The identity that was hidden from the world because the world does not want you to know why God made you. You know, a lot of families, to advertise their identity, have a symbol or have a family crest. Scottish families have plaids that define their family. Some groups will have a mark. Gangs will have tattoos. And so when you have a certain tattoo, you know you're a part of the gang. Do you know what is the mark, the symbol of being in God's family? Do you know what it is? It's baptism. Being baptized is the public symbol that says I'm not ashamed to be a part of the family. I'm advertising it to the world. I may not understand it all, but I'm in. If you haven't been baptized, you need to be. That's the symbol that says, I am in the family. In Acts 2, it says, those who believed what Peter had said were baptized and added to the church about 3,000 that day. The first metaphor is I'm in a family and my family helps me understand my true identity. There is a second metaphor that God uses to describe the church. And he says the church is like a temple. In other words, it's like a building that is erected for God's glory. It is a building where God's presence shows up. Where God is loved. Where God is honored and worshipped. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3... Don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and His Spirit lives in you? He's talking about the church. Have you ever been in a building when it was in the process of being built? And as you look around, you notice there are thousands of different pieces in that building. But the most important thing is that the pieces have to fit. If you have a beam that is a half an inch short, it doesn't hold up the roof. If you have a pipe that's two inches long, it doesn't make a connection. And if you don't make the connection, then you don't have a building. See, a building cannot stand in its own power unless it is connected, unless the things fit together. Why did God choose a temple as one of the illustrations of what it's like to be in his family, the church? Because in a building, all of the connecting parts support each other. This is the second benefit that you get from being a part of the family of God in God's temple. I'm supported by others. I'm not out there on my own. I'm not a lone ranger. I'm not by myself. In a building, all the connecting parts Hold each other up. And folks, there's going to be a time in your life when people need, you need people to hold you together. You're going to need them because you're going to be falling apart. And if you're not in the building, the temple of God, the family of God, the church of God, if you are not connecting, then nothing is going to hold you up. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, in Christ the whole building or body is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, Jesus, 
You two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by the Spirit. So together, we form the family of God and we form the temple of God. What is the temple of God building? A disconnected frame has no support. It has no stability. You need this. This is the second great need in your life. You need identity and you need stability. You were not meant to go through life disconnected. Why is it important for me to have support? Why is it important for me to have stability in life? Because the number one academic in our society today is loneliness. Folks, there are a lot of lonely people in this world. And they feel alone and disconnected. You know, I think it's interesting that we have more technology for connecting than we've ever had in history. And yet people feel disconnected. It's because we need each other. We need to be connected to each other, to support each other, and to help each other. The third description of the church is that of a body. The Bible calls the church the body of Christ. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, now you, he's talking about Christians, are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Now what does this illustrate? We're different parts, but we're all connected and together we compete, complete the body and we accomplish together what we could never do on our own. When we do that, we find our spot, we find our niche, we find out how we matter. We can find out our unique shape and our talents. You're not going to find that anywhere else except in the church. It's within the church that you discover your spiritual gifts and the various ways God has formed you to do His will. So the third benefit of belonging to a church family is this. In Christ's body, I discover my unique value. Romans 12 says, just as there are many parts in our body, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of it. And it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have different work to do. We belong to each other, and each of us needs all the others. First, it says that the body of Christ, the church, is made up of many parts. Folks, we're all different. Look around. Nobody is like you. In fact, God designed us that way. God loves variety. God made us all different. And we're all many parts. But everybody is needed. We're all needed to make the church complete. Nobody can say I'm not important because you're needed. If you have a jigsaw puzzle and one of the pieces is missing, what do you miss? The one that's missing. This verse says we all have work to do. But we all have different roles and different ministries. If all the parts did the same thing, it would be nonsense. Like if every part of the body was an ear, it would be mighty strange, wouldn't it? We all have different roles to play and different things to do, but we belong to each other. If you're in the family of God, if you're in the body of Christ, if you're in the temple of God, we belong to each other. We don't just belong to God. We belong to each other. And all of us needs all the others. 
In other words, what good is an eyeball if it's detached from the body? It's no good. What good is an ear if it's detached? It has no value. What good is your hand if you cut it off and put it on a shelf? It would just wither and die. You cannot be what God made you to be without a church family, without being connected to Christ's body. You cannot fulfill your purpose in life on your own. You have to be connected. You have to belong because we need each other. And folks, nobody, no one part is more important than the others. 1 Corinthians 12 says, If your foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that doesn't make it any less a part of the body. And if your ear says, I am not part of the body because I am only an ear and not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? The answer is no. All the parts are important. Now, some are more visible, but they're all important. In Ephesians 4, it says, In Christ's body, we're all connected to each other. And a disconnected part dies. Let me give you a fourth metaphor. The fourth description of the church in the Bible is it is a flock. Like a flock of sheep. In God's flock, we band together. Psalm 100 said, God made us and we're His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Now, why did God choose a flock of sheep as an illustration of what the church is like? Because in God's flock, I am protected and I am cared for. I'm not my own. I have other people looking out for me. I enjoy safety and security because I've got a shepherd. And that makes me more confident. And that makes me less anxious and less fearful. I know that God is protecting me because I am in his flock. Now why is that important? When is it important? When I'm being beat up with the world. When my family or my marriage is being strained to the breaking point. When I'm facing a personal crisis or a terminal illness. I need to know that someone is protecting and caring for me. Not just God cares and protects you, but in the flock of God, we help each other. What you need in your life is some people who will step up to bat for you when you need them. You need people in your life who will walk in when everybody else walks out of your life. You have anybody like that? That's what the church is for. We're to walk into each other's life when everybody else walks out. That's what it means to be in the flock of God. Now in the flock of God, God has created two kinds of people who are caregivers. Two kind of people who will step up for you. Two kind of people who will look out for you. And the first is pastors. The word pastor means shepherd. Pastors are to shepherd the flock of God. If you want to know my job description, look at 1 Peter 5.2. This is God's word to pastors, to shepherds. Take care of God's flock, his people that you're responsible for. Watch over them because you want to, not because you're forced to. I'm to take care of God's flock. I'm to be a shepherd. I'm to be responsible. I am to watch over you. Look at this verse in Hebrews 13, 17. 
It says, obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over <coughs> your souls and they, and they know they're accountable to God. Folks, can I share something with you? <coughs> to me, that's one of the scariest verses in the Bible. Because it says a pastor, I'm supposed to watch over your soul. And I'm going to be held accountable to God. The Bible says if you choose to put yourself under my care as a shepherd of First Christian Church, if you cho choose to join this flock and you say I'm going to be in this family, this is where I'm going to serve the body of Christ. This is where I'm going to build in to God's building. If you do that, then folks, one day, I'm going to have to give an account to God for how well I helped you grow spiritually. One day, I'm going to give an account to God. Eddie Owen is going to stand before God and I'm going to be personally having to give an account to God for how well I took care of your soul. If you're a part of this church, or if you join this church, I seek your prayers for me. I need your help. Folks, I'm truly concerned that I lead you in the right direction. This is the family of God. This is the flock of God. This is not like some business where if you mess it up, you start another one. Eternity is in the balance. Heaven and hell. It is extremely important. The Bible says I will give an account to God one day. I take this seriously. I want to make sure that you're all safe. I want to protect you from false doctrine and cults and wolves and false ideology and things like that. I want to lead you in the right way because I am accountable to God. But not only do you have pastors to help in the flock of God, we have each other. 58 times in the Bible, the phrase one another is used. The Bible says sheep take care of each other. Sheep care for sheep. The Bible uses the phrase one another. It says love one another. Care for one another. Help one another. Encourage one another. Support one another. Pray for one another. Love one another. Greet one another. 58 times. Here's what the Bible says in Galatians 2. Share each other's troubles and problems and in this way you obey the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? Love your neighbor as yourself. If one of our members, one of our friends of our church comes to you and they tell you that this is going on and they're having these problems and you may be very busy but you stop and you pray for them and you encourage them and you pat them on the back and you give them a warm, encouraging word. You have just done the one another's. You have just shepherded the flock yourself. You have been a part of the family of God. A part of the body of Christ. A part of the temple of God. A part of the flock of God. And there's been protection and care. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says encourage each other and give each other strength. You get courage, I get strength, you get strength when we encourage one another. Here's my question. Who's looking out for you? Here's another question. Who are you looking out for? Can you name three or four specific people you go, they're in the flock and I'm looking out for them and they're looking out for me. Folks, that's what it means to be a Christian. 
That is what it means to be a part of the family of God. That's what it means that I'm not just called to be loved. I'm called by God to belong. And you know, here's the really good stuff to me. All the things that you're most embarrassed about, God says, I want to use that for good. The very things that you're ashamed of, you know, your habits, your hurts, your hang-ups, your sins, your mistakes. God said in the family, I want you to use these to encourage others. Who better to encourage somebody who is on the verge of a divorce than somebody who has been on the verge of divorce? Who could better help somebody who is struggling with an addiction than somebody who has had an addiction? Who could better help somebody who has been molested than somebody who has been molested? Who could better help somebody who has gone through, say, a bankruptcy or has lost a child or anything? God says, I can use it all. Now, last of all, the church is called the garden, specifically a vineyard. This helps, talks about that would produce, to produce fruit. The Bible says in 1 John, Jesus is talking, he says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener and you're the branches. What's the lessons we get from this? They're talking about being fruitful. Your life needs to be productive. You need to make a difference with your life. This is the fifth thing that we learn, that in God's garden, my life becomes productive. It becomes fruitful. I do something with my life. Now I'm connected to the vine, and there's life-giving life flowing through the vine and the branches, and I am able to bear fruit. In fact, Jesus said a branch cannot bear fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful apart from me, Jesus says. I am the vine and you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. The point is a disconnected branch cannot bear fruit. And God has all kind of fruit that he wants to bear in your life. But none of that fruit will happen unless you're connected to the church. Unless you're connected to the vine. You have five basic needs in life. You have the need to know your identity. Who am I? You have a need to develop stability so you don't get blown away by life. You need it to increase your capacity. You need to have a security in your life. And you need a productivity. All five of these things are found in the church. In God's family, I learn my identity. In Christ's body, I discover my unique value. In God's temple, I learn how to support others and be supported. In God's flock, I come together for protection and care. And in the garden, I'm fruitful. I'm productive. Let me say it another way. In this life, if you really live the life that God made you to live, you need power to live on. You need people to live with. And you need principles to live by. You need a plan to live out. And you need a purpose to live for where are you going to get that outside of the church? Nowhere. My question is why should you remain disconnected? Folks, the church of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. I love America, but America is not the hope of the world. Politics is not the hope of the world. Economics is not the hope of the world. Education is not the hope of the world. If any of those things would have worked, we'd have already turned everything around. The hope of the world is the spread of the good news of Jesus Christ 
so that lives can be changed and hearts can be changed and families and marriage can be saved. The only thing that is going to last is the church. I want to close with one verse. Glory belongs to God in the church and in Christ Jesus for all time and eternity. Notice two things bring glory to God. The church is the family of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Folks, the church is God's bride. It's God's family. It's God's flock. It's God's purpose for your life. You are called to belong. <clears throat>